Okay, comrade. The Russian nightmare that get a call off here. Tune in and listen to the undisputed wrestling show. No, I tell your stinking head right off your body. Hailing from the holy city of Jerusalem, the OBW heavyweight champion, an eight-time television champion, and four-time Southern tag team champion, Muhammad Ali Bayez. That was that was so much better than I could ever do it. That was that was fantastic. Listen, man, I've been practicing for forty-five minutes, so <laughs> you probably did one take. You know, I kind of sure it was good. All no right. problem. Well, I'll, let me on, introduce guys? myself. I am the Bearded Wonder, or Das Wonderbeard, Zane Ulysses Paisley, and I hail from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'd like to introduce my co-host. Uh, he is the National Wrestling Alliance Continental Champion, the Morning Star, Will Huckabee. Will, what's your first question for Muhammad Ali Baez? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming on the show. Finally, Zane, we had a champion uh, that my, that I can consider, you know, on the same level as myself. There's not a few, there's very few guys, especially on the indie scene, that I can consider uh, worthy of being called a champion. Troy Miller is definitely not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Thank you for the praise, my man. Uh, if I heard you correctly, you are a current NWA champion. Is that correct, my my friend Morningstar? Yeah, yeah the uh, NWA I, Continental Champion. NWA Continental Champion. I, I would like to let you know that I've had the distinct honor in my career of losing to two-time NWA Heavyweight Champion Rob Conway about 38 times. <laughs> still have yet to beat, still have yet to beat Rob, and three of those contests were for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. So Ooh, uh, I have a lot of respect for the NWA. I have a lot of respect for Rob Conway as well. I had to get that. Thank out. you. Thank you. You know, we just got finished. Um, Having uh, the owner of OVW uh, on the show a couple of weeks ago and, and had a great conversation. Now, getting into conversations, my first question for you, um, how did you get into professional wrestling? What was your earliest influences, your earliest memories about this crazy sport that we're both involved in? Man, I grew up in the 80s. So uh, you guys just had the Million Dollar Man on uh, the hour before me, and he, uh, he was my entertainment on Saturday morning. Him and Hulk Hogan and also the Warrior and the guys from the late 80s, uh, right around the time that I was maybe 9 to 12 years old, I was so into it. But as I grew up, I kind of got into other things and uh, I discovered girls and, you know, the things that happened as a teenager. So I kind of lost, uh, I don't want to say interest because I would still watch when my friends would uh, get a pay-per-view, but I wasn't following it very closely. Uh, and then when I was in college, uh I was uh, 20 years old, and I went to a military academy. So, like, we really had nothing to do but shine shoes and stuff. And when you were a junior, so after you'd been there for two years, you got the privilege to go to the officers' club and drink some beer, and they had a big screen TV. And this was on Thursday night, uh, and I saw SmackDown. And I started going there every Thursday and watching <laughs> SmackDown on the big screen TV. And this was around the time that uh, uh, Cactus Jack was feuding with Triple H. It was that era. And that's the storyline that hooked me. So I started watching. And I was only maybe 45 minutes away from Madison Square Garden. So I would go to the gardens all the time and watch the house shows. And, man, I was just into it. And I always said that if I had the opportunity to try this, I would do it. But it seemed like such a pie-in-the-sky kind of thing. Because who, who really goes and becomes a wrestler? It's not like your, your guidance counselor in high school isn't going to give you a pamphlet on that career path. So... Through a chance encounter a few years later after I was out of the military, I was buying a book, uh, somebody's autobiography, I think it was Ronnie Piper's, at a, a bookstore in Lexington, Kentucky. And the, the guy who was checking me out uh, in terms of taking my money, not like any kind of humble erotic thing, but the guy who was uh, <laughs> the, doing the thing was uh, apparently an independent wrestler. And he told me that he was an independent wrestler and that if I went to this one place, I could see shows and get trained and all this kind of stuff. So... I checked it out. I went out to Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Uh, I think it was 2003, and uh, I uh, I paid some uh, money. I think I paid about $800, and uh, I got four lessons over the course of five weeks, and then that was it. The guy left and kind of left me high and dry, and it was a great introduction to this zany world of pro wrestling. Mm. That that sounds close to almost my experience. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh. 
Now, moving into the next, you know, my next question and stuff, you know, being, uh, obviously, being, you know, the name Muhammad Ali uh, has a certain connotation to it. Um, how do, I don't know how to ask this. I hope this one go ahead and say it. Being a, a wrestler of Middle Eastern descent, uh, how do you um, get along with uh, with the fans and, and the other wrestlers and stuff? But do you feel you have a, you have to live up to a certain uh, standard being uh, a, a wrestler of Middle Eastern descent? Well, I, it's it's a blessing, man. Don't get me wrong. Like, I in this business, you need to be a genetic freak. You need to be related to somebody, or you need to have, be at the right place at the right time. And hopefully, if you're the third uh, of those uh, choices, that you have a skill set that once you get your opportunity, you can capitalize on it. I, I'm not a genetic freak, and I'm not related to anybody. But what I do have is a very unique ethnicity and a very unique physical appearance. Uh, so... It's always been a strength. Uh, I didn't set out to like do that stuff, but I do distinctly remember the Iron Sheik as a kid. Uh, when I first started wrestling, or maybe or watching wrestling as a child, so he was a big influence uh, in my household because I grew up in the '80s. I, I'm Iranian, and in the '80s, being Iranian was not a very popular thing. So you didn't see very many Iranians on TV, and the Iron Sheik was like a huge influence on me because he's a part of pop culture. So later on in life, when uh, it was suggested to me, hey, maybe you should do something uh, Middle Eastern-wise, uh, I was all for it. But here's here's the juxtaposition of this whole situation. It, it, when I came to OBW, it was when it was uh, WWE developmental. So I had to bring something at a guy, at a guy who was 5'11", and at the time 185 pounds, I had to have something that was going to make me stand out. And that's what it was. The problem for me, though, is that, like I alluded to earlier, that I went to a military academy for college. Uh, I had classmates that went to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and lost limbs. They lost lives. So when I was doing it on regional television here in Louisville, it was a real kind of weird experience for me personally because professionally in wrestling, I'm benefiting by reinforcing, A, stereotypes that my like people that have a similar background as me suffer from, but also B, am I in any way disrespecting people that in my life, and at that point it was only six, seven years removed, uh, that were very important to me that had suffered horrific consequences in the war. And ultimately I came to the realization in my own head that, you know, I had suffered from these stereotypes my entire life, so if I could use them to my advantage for once, I was going to do so. So I had no regrets whatsoever, and, and it was... Uh, I had no business being on the OVW television show when I first debuted. I had been there for about a year and was put on television as a reoccurring character, and that never happened back then uh, because WWE was paying people to be there and for them to be on the TV show. And I was on the other side of the fence. I was the guy who was paying to be there to get a job. So it's a, in a way, it's a blessing because I got those opportunities through it, but in a way, it was also a curse because uh, ultimately the reason why I and my partner had that spot that we had was because a certain person in Connecticut enjoyed the gimmick and the way we worked. But ultimately the owner of the company said that we couldn't, they couldn't take a gamble on that because it was so, it was only two or three years removed from the Muhammad Hassan debacle with the USA Network and all that kind of stuff. So while I flirted with WWE very early in, in my career, in my journey to professional wrestling, because the hammer was put down, I was forced to do something else other than rely on that ethnicity in order to try to get where I wanted to go. If that kind of makes sense. That was a long, rambling answer, man. I'm sorry. Ah. Oh, no, man. You're good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let Zane ask his first couple of questions for you before I go ahead and hit you around, too, all right? No sweat, man. No all sweat. right, well. Well, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show, and we have on, and I'm not going to do this justice, but we have on the Ohio Valley Wrestling heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali Vaez. Uh, Ali, um, can you uh, let our listeners know how they can follow your career and, and give us uh, all your social media information? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Ali underscore Vaez, A-L-I underscore V-A-E-Z. Uh, there's another person with the same name as me, but he's like an intelligence analysis and analyst or something for some Washington think tank. So oh. you probably won't confuse the two of us. 
Uh, I'm on Facebook under my real name, Muhammad Ali Baez, and I also have a YouTube channel under the same name. My YouTube channel has about 180 matches over the course of the last uh, nine years of my career. Well, very nice. Now, uh, as Will uh, said uh, just a few minutes ago, that we had Nightmare Danny Davis on uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, our our listeners, because uh, we go all around the world, but our listeners might not know the fact uh, that they can watch Ohio Valley Wrestling uh, through the Internet. You don't have to be based in Louisville on the local TV station. Uh, so if our listeners go to ovwrestling.com, you can watch the uh, the shows, the weekly shows every week. I, what is it? It's posted on uh, the day after it, after it's on uh, the uh, television. Uh, I think it's two days after it. We tape Wednesday. Uh, it airs Saturday, and then it is posted online through that website uh, on Mondays. But the thing, the, the thing I like about OVW is up until the point, uh, WWE owns a significant portion of the OVW tape library for obvious reasons. Um, so I think that relationship severed in 2008. And uh, anything after 2008 is available online on Daily Motion, on YouTube. Uh, you got to hunt for it a little bit, but it's out there. So uh, it's very accessible, and it's the longest running broadcast wrestling television show in existence. We're going to tape uh, episode 819 tomorrow, and it happens to coincidentally be my 400th television to the people. So wow. uh, we've been we've been going for a long time. That that is obviously quite a uh, an accomplishment. And as you said, you were the eight time television champion uh, in in Ohio Valley. You know what what what's been you know the there's been so much change in uh, OVW since you've been there. With you know when you first started out, it was uh, co produced with WWE, and then there was a working relationship with TNA, and now it's strictly independent. You know what? What have been some of the the more interesting or maybe dynamic changes that have happened since you've been there? Well, it's been such a it's been such a roller coaster ride, really. Uh, at looking at the different uh, national organizations that have been affiliated with OVW, but the, the broader picture, and this is something that I realized in 2008 when WWE pulled out. I remember it was like it was yesterday because literally Danny pulled me and Khalil, my partner, into his office in December of 2007 and said, hey. Uh, WWE is extremely interested in the two of you. Make sure you don't get hurt over Christmas break. Make sure you don't do anything stupid. Don't get arrested. Don't do anything. They're very serious. Uh, so we were on cloud nine. And then literally six weeks later, Dana's telling all of us, uh, a week after Johnny Ace came to look at a bunch of guys that they were pulling out. So it was, that's what I'm talking about with the roller coaster. So mm-hmm. there was very like awful, uh, times, but at the same time, you got to put it in perspective. OVW, to my knowledge, is the only place in the world that is a weekly territory. Territory meaning every week there is a new episode of television that is produced. And the actual show itself is a traveling company. So at the time that I started, I was wrestling six days a week. Uh, I could have had the opportunity to wrestle seven, but I had to go and, and make money at a serving job in order <laughs> to support my wrestling addiction. But... Uh, uh, it's, it's changed now, and now we have, uh, on average, two to three shows a week. But the thing is, is I mentioned earlier, it's a full-scale territory. So in the nine years that I've been at OVW, I have literally worn every hat that there is to wear in a territory, from being the jabroni guy that's putting over the stars, to being in a faction, to being a push tag team, to being the leader of a faction, to all the other things that I've done in the ring. And that pales in comparison to the amount of matches that I've agented behind the scenes or the episodes that I've written personally or the part of a committee or running town. You, you, you literally get the opportunity to learn the wrestling business, not just how to do a moonsault and kick somebody in the head. It's the business because I got into this very seriously because I wanted to earn a living. And if I'm wearing tights to earn that living or if I'm sitting behind a keyboard to earn that living, either way, my time at OVW, whether or not TNA was dangling a carrot or whether or not WWE was dangling a carrot with an arm plate. Uh, and for a brief time, Ring of Honor as well with the uh, Jim Cornette uh, situation there with that crossover. No matter who the carrot was, the, the bigger goal was I'm here because I want to get all these skills. Because at some point, this business is going to rebound. And when that business rebounds, I need to have as many tools in my tool belt as possible to make sure that I'm a part of it. Does that make sense? 
Oh, it makes complete sense. And, and not that, that your ultimate goal should be going to WWE or anything, but we know of, of guys like Jimmy Jacobs that are, that signed a contract with WWE and, and not in, as a, as a, uh, in-ring performer. You know, I think Adam Cole's in that same boat too, where, you know, learning the whole business can get you along, uh, further down the line. And that's, yeah, that's absolutely. awesome. Look at- Look Go at Sarah Del Rey. I mean, Sarah Del Rey uh, established a body of work all over the world in multiple promotions and was considered the premier female wrestler in the world. WWE hired her to be a coach, and now she is not taking bumps and has cemented a job for herself for a very long time because she has a unique skill set that nobody else in the world has. What other woman that's still in the business can say that they did it the hard way and traveled the entire world to earn a reputation, get over, and number three, and most importantly, is to learn the actual art of what we do. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's such an invaluable resource if they want to ever put money behind their women's division. you got to start at the top. Or, I'm sorry, you got to start at the bottom and give them a fundamental base. So she's an excellent example of somebody who maybe she 10, 15 years ago didn't say, hey, I'm going to go be the women's uh, coach at NXT. <laughs> but... You know, that's the journey of life. You take what comes to you. You know, everybody's dealt a different hand in life, and it's up to you how you play the hand that you've dealt. But when opportunities come your way, you'd be crazy not to take it because you box yourself in to think that I need to do this or I need to do that or my character wouldn't do this. I mean, come on, get real. So in in terms of longevity, it was always something, and it was something that Rick Rogers drilled in my head from day one, is uh, he told me that, to, to realistically, and that's the thing about Rip, is he won't uh, feed a bunch of smoke up your ass. He is, uh, he is a, he will tell you if you should not be in the wrestling business. And he told me, literally, the first year I started with him, that I needed to learn how to be a general. Period. Because I'm not six, I'm six foot tall, and right now I'm 195 pounds. So by no means am I a big guy at all. So I better be able to have the opportunity to take a big guy and make him look like a million dollars because then that makes me useful. So I don't know. And that was a long, I'm doing a lot of long winded answers to my guys. I apologize. Oh, no, no, we, we love it. And, and that was actually going to uh, segue into my next question because we have had Rip Rogers on, on the show before and, uh, you know, just an amazing mind for the business. Get, it, would you consider him probably the most respected trainer in, in professional wrestling? I think within the business, absolutely. Rip is one of the most respected people in the business. Uh, I mean, look at how many people have passed through his halls that are made of any WWE television right now. Uh, and true, other people had a hand in their development, but he has consistently been able to. And those are just the people that you see. There are countless of guys that never made it to that stage that could go anywhere in the world and wrestle anybody, no matter what their experience level is, because Rip Rogers gave them that skill set. That is what Rip does, period. And and, and I mentioned that earlier. I, I have full confidence that I can walk into any show in the country and wrestle anybody, whether I've seen their footage or I know who they are, assuming that they cooperate. It's a, yeah. it's a, very, it's a very lost art, and Rip is one of the masters at teaching it. So I'd encourage anybody that listens to this that wants to get into the wrestling business, take advantage of Rip while he's around. Uh, and, and thank God for Twitter, because now Rip is totally active on Twitter, and he tweets all day. So he's getting himself out there, and I think wrestling fans are starting to realize, oh, there's this hidden gem, this guy that's done all these things and has had a hand in so many people's development, and he lives in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he likes to tweet a lot. So <laughs> I'm glad Rip's getting all that uh, accolade. And, and, you know, he, he was on our show and, and we laugh about, uh, how many times he, he cursed on the show, which, which we didn't mind. But one of the f- things that I love about him so much is that we asked him a couple, uh, questions that were a little silly and he just completely no sold him. And he, he's just, just a, a really funny, good guy and, and we really like him a lot. So, uh, oh so, yeah, absolutely. Well, Absolutely. And Rip is, Rip at the same time though can be one of the most intimidating people ever. Uh, when I, my first day at OVW, I, uh, I applied for this open tryout. And, uh, this was like, I don't know, 2005 maybe. And I came on a Saturday morning and I didn't know it was Rip's class. I just came at the time that they told me to come. And I don't think Rip 
either Rip was ribbing me, which is probably the case, or nobody told Rip that anybody was showing up. But I showed up with my bag, and there's 60 guys in class, and he looks at me in front of everybody, and he goes, uh, can I cuss on this show, by the way? Oh, yeah, go for it. Okay, I don't want to do Rip injustice, so I want to give these <laughs> exact words. Uh, he goes, who the fuck are you? And I say, oh, uh, hi, my, name's, my name's Ali, and uh, I was told to be here at this time for uh, a tryout. And he looked at my boots. Okay, now, I got dressed before I came in. He looked at my boots. He looked at me. He looked back at my boots. He looked back at me, and he goes, what are you, a fucking packy or something? <laughs> now, up until that point in my life, in 25 years, I had never heard the term packy as like a racial slur. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I looked at him all weird, and he goes, you know, you know, one of those Arab guys. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, I'm Persian. And he's like, okay, all right, nice boots. Go ahead, sit down. So there you go. That was my that was my meeting with Rip Rogers for the very first time. Well, you can't get much better than that. Uh, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show. We have on the eight-time Ohio Valley Wrestling television champion and the current Ohio Valley Wrestling heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali Baez. And I am going to kick it over to the NWA Continental Champion, the Morning Star, Will Huckabee. Now, Rip, I'm sorry, we were talking about Rip and I didn't mention his name. <laughs> Uh, Ali, I was going to ask you, you know, you mentioned earlier about, you know, you're not a very big guy, uh, you know, under 60, you know, you're not 260 pounds. Uh, but we noticed, you know, especially on the Indies and stuff, it's not the big guys that's really getting looked at. How do you feel personally about how the wrestling business has shifted from being a predominantly big man business to favoring the, the smaller, uh, more athletic guys who can really get in there and, and give the fans the action that they want? Uh, I love it. First off, and second of all, I think that the business is forced to do that, and I'll explain. Uh, when I was in my quote-unquote prime hiring ages, so like from 28 to 32, WWE was not interested in anybody who wasn't six foot two or an underwear model or something to that effect. They did not want, for the most part, most indie wrestlers, to my knowledge. Now, there are obviously people that were signed, but uh, the door was continuously slammed in my face because of... We're not, we're just not looking for wrestlers right now. This is entertainment, so on and so forth. But I think through the transition, and again, I'm looking at this from the outside perspective. I didn't, I didn't work for the company and I don't have like inside knowledge here, but I feel like the, the developmental system of taking people that fit a certain criteria of who they were trying to hire wasn't panning out because the wrestling business, if you don't have a passion for it, is awful. I mean, you're dealing with carny people all the time. Your body hurts all the time. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of trials and tribulations. And if you don't have a true love or passion for it, then in the long run, more than likely, statistically speaking, you're not going to succeed. So when you're eliminating people who are actively pursuing those jobs and they're so motivated that they're going out on their own time and learning the art and the craft, like any job that you would normally apply for. You know, you go to college to be a doctor and then you get hired to be a doctor. You don't get hired to be a doctor because somebody thinks you could be a good doctor and then tries <laughs> to teach you how to be a doctor. You know what I mean? So after a while, when you have kind of a, a depth in uh, a talent roster, then that's not a concern. And these, I guess, geez, I'm trying to not, I'm trying to dance around a topic, but also not bury myself. So let me just come out and say it. Uh, I think they were forced to change their policies. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, the change in regime about two years ago up there. Uh, and an example of that is uh, all these Ring of Honor guys that have gone there and been wildly successful. Uh, and I don't have to name their names because anybody listening to this watches that product. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, these guys proved that they could get over on their own without the machine. So if you put the machine behind them, imagine how much more they could be worth in the long run. And that was, I think, the calculus that was made up there that made that uh, hiring practice shift. And and in my, I have two practical examples for you. Practical example number one is in like 2011, I called Ty Bailey's office twice a week for a year. And I'm not exaggerating. I would cut on my break. As a personal trainer at Urban Active, I would call Ty Bailey on Mondays and on Fridays. On Monday, I would leave a normal message, and on Friday, I would cut him a promo. And I <laughs> never, ever 
got called back. When Ty Bailey was replaced, within two weeks, they called me. So what does that tell you? And it's not a coincidence because this time frame that I'm speaking of is when a lot of these guys who had gone out and made themselves much more known than I am, uh, but made themselves viable stars on the independent circuit, how is WWE not going to look at that? Uh, the second example is I uh, I was sent to a paid tryout in, uh, I want to say, 2013, 2012, to 2012. Uh, and when you do those things, you're usually married to another guy. Like, you'll share a rental car, you'll share a hotel room, and uh, you'll share travel arrangements. So it just so happened that myself and uh, Sammy Callahan were married together for this tryout. Uh, you, you already know who got the job. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he... Uh, we, we went to this tryout or whatnot, and both of us were told at the end of this tryout, congratulations, welcome to the team. And then a few hours later, both of us were told, well, we spoke a little too soon. We can't uh, guarantee you the job yet. You still have to go through some more things. So I had the high of getting that welcome to the team that I had been working for for 10 years at that point. And then a couple hours later, it was taken away. The roller coaster of being arrested.